without further ado, um, our very first session speaker of World Ocean Day Youthathon 2021 is Amar Stephenson, and she, um, I believe, is already a panelist. So, Amar, if you want to go ahead and kick us off. Hi everyone, so it's Ema here. Um, I'm so excited to chat with you guys now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, so just bear with me one moment. Yeah, so welcome to the first Youthathon session, Nurturing Nature Biodiversity Edition. I'm going to click the next slide. So I am Ema, and if you have any questions about today's um, session, feel free to message in the chat or else you can actually send me an email afterwards if you think of me afterwards, or you can connect with me on my socials, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, next slide. So kind of before I get into the actual discussion, just a little bit about myself, so you're not wondering um, who on earth is giving me all this information. I am a conservationist and an educator, and my kind of main passions lie in using math, computer science, paleontology, zoology, and conservation. You may think that's an absolute mouthful and how on earth does one have all those kind of topics in a career, but it's actually quite a common field and it's um, extremely, extremely interesting kind of using paleontology and math and computer science to figure out how to conserve today's nature. Um, I'm also a volunteer with different organizations, such as, as you can see down below, Green Sod Ireland, which is a land trust who basically take in land and conserve it and protect it and bring it back to its natural state. I'm also involved with Youth STEM 2030, which is a scientific journal run by youth for youth. So we basically publish a ton of different um, science communication articles, research articles and review articles written by youth as young as, I think we have um, eight and nine year olds who have written articles for us as far as um, 20 to kind of 23. And yeah, then I also with World Oceans Day, this is my final year on the World Oceans Day Youth Advisory Council, so I am very sad to be going this year, but um, as Laura said, there's applications soon, so I would highly, highly recommend anyone joining the council um, this year. It's been an absolute blast the past two years. Then finally, I also received a scholarship to do my Master's in Biodiversity and Conservation in Trinity College Dublin in Ireland and this September, so I am so excited to learn more about how to combine all those fancy topics, math, paleontology, zoology, to conserve the planet. Um, next slide, please. So with that then, this session is kind of divided into two. We have time travel, so that we're going to discuss the evolution of biodiversity today, and then conservation. So why should we conserve the planet and how can we do that? Next slide. The goal then of this session is to be able to answer the following three questions. What is the difference between an extinction and a mass extinction? Are we in the mass midst of a mass extinction today? And what can we do to help save the planet? Next slide. So with that, let's start with the first section, which is time travel. And we're gonna have a primary focus upon mass extinctions. Next slide. So essentially the geological time frame is divided up into four main categories. You have the Precambrian period, which lasted from 4.6 billion to 541 million years ago, give or take a little bit. And next slide. Next slide, sorry, thank you. <laughs> and then we're gonna travel to the Paleozoic, which run from 540 to 251 million years. Next slide. Then we're gonna go to the Mesozoic, which ran from 251 to 66 million years ago. And then finally, the next slide. Finally, then we're gonna to go to the Cenozoic, which is today, basically. So it's the last 66 million years. Next slide. So with that, let's start off with the Precambrian period. So this is the very first section in Earth's history. And it ran from 4.6 billion to 541 million years ago, approximately. Next slide. So as you can see, we are here. And the Precambrian period is made up of three different sections. So you have the Hadean, the Archaean, and the Proterozoic. Next slide. So at the very, very start of Earth was the Hadean Eon. And as you can see by this figure, this is actually almost what Earth would have looked like. The blue and green planet that we know and love today was not always that blue and green, full of life, healthy planet. In fact, it was actually very, very, very hot and very 
honestly scary to live in. Um, next slide. It was insanely hot, as I've said. The surface temperatures were approximately 230 degrees Celsius or 446 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, now, despite being this hot, there was water on the planet, except it was just so insanely hot for organisms to live in. Um, you also then had meteorite impacts. Um, these were extremely, extremely common. And then you also had volcanism. So basically there was a ton of volcanic activity, magma, um, and all in all, the planet was extremely, extremely hostile. It was severe, it was tough. If any organisms did live then, it would have been a very, very difficult time to live. In fact, scientists predict that either life began after this period or it tried to um, form within this period, but it was so severe that it just kept dying off. <clears throat> Next slide. After this then, in the Archaean period, we had the origin of life in the form of microbes. So the earliest evidence of life came from 3.77 billion years ago. And again, these were unicellular, tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic organisms. But some scientists predict that it actually may have formed as early as 4.41 billion years ago. And as I said, they're not sure if life formed in the Archaean or the Hadean. Um, next slide. Um, just to answer a question, did animals live on the really, really hot Earth? Technically, they weren't animals, they were microorganisms. So animals, they were um, life that you couldn't even see with your own eye. They were completely, completely tiny and they are our ancient ancestors. So the evidence of first life then, you might be wondering if they were these tiny, tiny, tiny organisms that you couldn't even see with your own eye, how do we know they were there? How do we know they existed? Well, there are two main types of evidence. You have microfossils, which is literally where the organism was fossilized and we can see it in rocks. And the other is through isotopic signals in rocks. So essentially, um, as you know, absolutely everything is made up of different elements. We're made up of carbon and other elements, and so are rocks. So scientists can basically take a rock and test what it is made up of um, and test if it has any um, what's known as stable carbon isotopes. So just a type of element. And by testing that, they can figure out if there was life um, around at the time that rock formed. And not only that, they can tell what kind of life was available at that time. So scientists found that the organisms that kind of originated first were tubular. So they kind of looked like little tubes and they were filamentous, which kind of made it look like they had little hairs, but they weren't hairs, they were filaments. And life originated most likely in submarine hydrothermal vents. So these are essentially underwater volcanoes. Next slide. So then after the Archaeon, we enter the Proterozoic. And this is the last um, period within the Precambrian. And here you had the origin of multicellular life forms. So before we had tiny unicellular, which means they only had one cell, they were extremely simple, um, and again, you couldn't even see them. But now, in this period, we see the form of more complex life. Life is starting to evolve and get bigger and more complex and stronger. Um, and at the start, you had very simple multicellular life forms. And by the end of it, you had quite complex life forms that almost resembled animals. Next, um, next slide, please. So as you can see there, three main events that happened in that was the formation of Earth, 4.6 billion years ago, and it's extremely hot and tough state. Then the origin of life in the Archaeon and the origin of multicellular life in the Proterozoic. Next slide. This then brings us to the next period of time, the Paleozoic, which ran from 540 to 251 million years. Next slide. So again, here, you can see that the Paleozoic is made up of loads of different periods that we're gonna discuss now in more detail. The Cambrian, the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and the Permian period. Next slide. So starting off in this Paleozoic, you have the Cambrian period. And within that, you have this major, major life event known as the Cambrian explosion. And this is honestly one of the most well-known and one of the most vital um, periods in Earth's history. 
This led to the sudden appearance of complex animals. So now finally we actually have animals um, on Earth. And also we have the origin of all major animal phyla. You may be wondering what a phyla is, but a phyla is essentially the large main grouping of animals. So we have thousands of, upon thousands upon thousands of different species of animals. For example, we are Homo sapiens, and you also have in Ireland alone, I think there's over 100 species of bees, whereas a phyla, there's only um, 30 roughly um, groups of phyla. Um, next slide, please. So with that then, in the Cambrian explosion, we had the formation of major animal groups. So the big, big groups were made. And then in the next period, known as the Ordovician, we had the Ordovician biodiversification. So this is where all the smaller groups within those really big groups were made. And here we saw um, a ton of corals start to form, some trilobites and fish. And basically this was a time of major, major diversity. So there was so much life evident on the planet. And it's important to note as well that life on land were strictly microbes. There may have been some fungi, but at this point in time, all of these cool creatures were all in the ocean. Next slide. We then come to our first mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician period and the start of the Silurian period. Next slide. So this is one of the five major mass extinctions and it's actually the second largest. As I said, um, life was pretty much restricted to the marine realms, to the oceans, and approximately 85% of that life died off in one go. Well, not really one go, but one mass extinction. And this, despite this, it actually didn't have that much of an impact on the ecosystem or the diversity of animals available. It was only about 5 million years later, which seems like a long time, but in the whole scheme of things, it's not actually that long at all. Only 5 million years later, the diversity of animals recovered to the pre-extinction levels, which means that basically animals recovered pretty quickly. There are many different causes for this mass extinction. Some scientists believe that it was glaciation. So basically the earth got really, 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 really cold and formed a ton of ice sheets and glaciers. Other scientists believe that it was anoxia events. And this simply means that the oceans lost its oxygens, oxygen. So basically the animals could no longer breathe. Um, other scientists believe that it was volcanism. So basically there was lots of volcanic activity and eruptions, magma, things like that. And it just snuffed out all the organisms. Most likely it was a combination of um, multiple different factors with glaciation being the kind of main uh, or primary um, cause. Next slide, please. So after this then, um, we had terrestrialization in the form of land plants. So as we said before, the kind of only things that were on land um, that we know of were microbes and a little bit of fungi. But here we see that in the Ordovician period, we had bryophytes. And these are types of moss, basically, and other little things. Um, we also had vascular plants in the Silurian period. And vascular plants are basically plants that have the ability to take up water from the ground and move it around its body and survive. Um, and this had profound impacts on the environment. It gave animals new habitats, it gave them new resources and food, and it also oxygenized our, or oxygenated our atmosphere. So basically, the formation of plants on land led to amazing, amazing opportunities for animals. Next slide, please. And eventually then, in the next period, in the Devonian period, we had forests. So basically, as plants dominated the kind of bare, empty land, they grew and they grew and they grew and they formed an evolved forest. Next slide, please. And eventually this led to the terrestrialization by animals. And before this, we did have some insects that kind of had eventually developed on land and things like that. But eventually then we had the first vertebrates known as tetrapods. And these would have been our ancient ancestors. Um, some, uh, some scientists believe that some animals may have actually walked on land um, during the Cambrian period, which as we discussed was pretty much the first time real complex animals evolved. Um, some also say that it may have been the Silurian period, which we just discussed a few moments ago. 
but it was most definitely that vertebrates first evolved on land in the Devonian period. Um, and it was really because of the plants that they did, because the plants gave them new habitats, it gave them oxygen, it gave them food, it gave them shelter, it um, shaded them from heat, it gave them just so much, it literally gave them life. Next slide. And unfortunately, we have another mass extinction, the second one that occurred at the end of the Devonian period and the start of the Carboniferous period. Next slide. And here was um, affected mostly marine life. So the terrestrial life were pretty much unaffected by this. They didn't really have any problems with this mass extinction, but approximately 50% of um, marine genera went extinct. If you're wondering what a genera is, it's basically there are different levels for um, of taxonomy. So basically you have the species. So for us, we'd be homo sapiens, and then you have genus, so we'd be homo, and then you have family and class and so on, and phyla is at the very top. Um, so yeah, 50% of those just completely wiped off the face of the planet. And then the causes of this was sea level changes, again, anoxia, where we lost oxygen, and volcanism. So there was tons of volcanic activity. Next slide. So after this, we had the Carboniferous period. And this was a really, really cool period on Earth. So we had the evolution of the first reptiles. And in the waters, sharks became the kind of dominant um, animal that, uh, that um, swam about. Then you also had the evolution of more plants and trees. And basically, life was just really flourishing. It looked amazing. And we had the evolution of really, really cool creatures. Next slide, please. And again, we have the third mass extinction, which brings us to the start of the next period in time, the Mesozoic. So at the end of the Permian and the start of the Triassic is the third mass extinction. Next slide, please. So this was known as the Great Dying because it was the largest extinction event. And as you can see, about 81% of all marine life was wiped off the planet and about 70% of terrestrial, so land-based vertebrates were also wiped off. And if you're wondering what the difference between a vertebrate is and an invertebrate, so invertebrates are things that don't have a backbone. So they're like insects and worms, things like that. Whereas the vertebrates would have be things like us that do have a, bone, a backbone. Um, and the causes of this major, major mass extinction includes increased temperatures, ocean anoxia, so again, a lack of oxygen, and an increase in carbon dioxide. Does that sound a little bit familiar? I think it might. Um, next slide, please. So again, you can see all the kind of major things that occurred in the Paleozoic. You had three um, mass extinctions that occurred in the middle, one at the very end, but you also had the origin of complex life and you had the terrestrialization of plants and animals and vertebrates and invertebrates. Um, so it was just a really, really cool, cool period. Next slide, please. And now you're entering the Mesozoic period, which lasted 251 to 66 million years. And this was a really, really, really interesting period and one that's most well known for the dinosaurs. Next slide, please. So again, you can see here that the Mesozoic is made up of three different parts. You have the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period. Next slide, please. So what happened during the first period of the Mesozoic, the Triassic period? Well, both mammals and dinosaurs actually first formed. And most people um, kind of know that we are now the dominant mammals. We are now the dominant um, land creature. Um, but we actually evolved a long, long time ago and we evolved alongside the dinosaurs. Next slide, please. And unfortunately, after this, there was another major mass extinction known as the Triassic-Jurassic period. Next slide, please. So this um, greatly impacted both the life on land and in seas. It wasn't a major um, compared to the kind of previous ones in that about 30% of marine genera died off, but it was still a pretty big mass extinction. And it actually had profound impacts on the environment as this extinction actually allowed dinosaurs to become the main creature on land. They became the dominant creatures. Um, and the causes of this mass extinction include climate change, sea level um, fluctuation, and ocean acidification. 
So the last there, ocean acidification, simply means where um, means that carbon dioxide, lots and lots of that, was entering the oceans and making it more acidic, making it basically more toxic to animals to live in. Next slide, please. So within the Jurassic, then we know that dinosaurs became dominant and were extremely abundant. But as I said earlier, mammals were also formed at the same time as dinosaurs. And we actually survived that last mass extinction. But during this period when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we were extremely small and tend to be nocturnal. So essentially that means that they came out during the day or came out during the night and slept during the day. And this was really, really effective as it meant that mammals could avoid the really high temperatures of the sun um, throughout the day and they could avoid um, those dinosaur predators. We also then in the Jurassic period had the first flowering plants and this was really really important um, in the whole scheme of life as it led to co-evolution where two, two things evolved at the one time together um, and yeah it was just a really really lovely time in history. Next slide please. But unfortunately, it led to another mass extinction, the fifth and final major mass extinction, known as the Cretaceous to the Paleogene period. Next slide, please. So this was a massive mass extinction and affected about 75% of all life on Earth. And this had a major, major environmental impact as it actually allowed for adaptive radiation. And this simply means that as the dinosaurs were one of the main creatures to be wiped out, other animals, particularly mammals, then saw, okay, well, now this habitat is free of the dinosaurs. I'm going to move in there. Or now, okay, these plants are no longer being eaten by dinosaurs. I'm going to eat that. And to very simplify it, um, that's what happened. And um, mammals then became the dominant land animal. The causes of this extinction are highly debated, and lots of scientists agree that it was actually due to asteroid impacts and meteorite impacts. Others say that it was climate change or sea level change, and again, volcanism. So again, volca volcanic activity. Next slide, please. So again, we can see in the Mesozoic, we had the two major mass extinctions, the final two that we know of. And um, we also had a period where dinosaurs and mammals formed together in the Triassic, dinosaurs became dominant in the Jurassic, and then finally, mammals and our ancestors became dominant in the Cretaceous. Next slide, please. In the Paleogene, I meant, sorry. <laughs> so that brings us to the Cenozoic, and that is the current time frame that we live in today. And it's been around for the last 66 million years ago. Next slide, please. So now, as I've said earlier, mammals rule the world. And that's kind of the dominant thing that's happening in the Cenozoic at the moment. Next slide, please. So now that we've kind of went through geological history and we kind of know the broad scope of what's happened throughout time, let's focus on the mass extinction events a little bit more. Next slide, please. So here we can see all five major mass extinction events and the time that they originated. And one common factor is that they all occur millions upon millions upon millions of years apart most of them about 100 plus million years, bar one, which lasted, um, which occurred 50 million years apart, Permian Triassic and the Triassic Jurassic. Now, we also know the causes of these from climate change to sea level change to volcanism and asteroids. It's been loads of different, different topics. Next slide, please. But we actually haven't discussed what is a mass extinction. Now, an extinction, is simply one species dying off. So that could be one species of bumblebee, one species of lizard, that's an extinction. But a mass extinction, next slide please, is a bit difficult to define. There are tons of different definitions available. However, scientists all agree that a mass extinction in general is the sudden rapid decrease in biodiversity over a short geological time. By geological time, I mean the whole scheme of things. So short time to us would be, you know, five minutes, maybe an hour, maybe a few days, but a short geological time could be a couple million years or a couple hundreds of thousands of years. Um, next slide, please. 
but that definition is very, very, very broad. And instead, scientists generally agree upon Sapkowski's definition. So Sapkowski was a scientist in the 1980s, and he basically stated that a mass extinction is any major loss in multiple types of organisms across the globe over a short period of time that results in a decrease in diversity. So basically, um, a lot of animals died all across the place. That's what a mass extinction is. Next slide, please. Now let's look at extinction rates today. The extinction rates today are hundreds to thousands of times higher than the natural baselines of extinctions. So basically, extinctions are normal. They happen to loads of different species all throughout history. It's a natural process that cannot be avoided. However, there is a natural baseline to it, so an average at which this happens. The extinction rates today, as I said, are hundreds to thousands of times higher, and in other words, faster than that rate. Scientists estimate that about 150 species are extinct every single day, and they've estimated that 30 to 50% of all life on the planet will be extinct by 2050. So, what do you think? Are we facing a mass extinction? Next slide, please. Honestly, it's unclear if we are because of the different definitions, because there is a debate over what can be defined as a mass extinction. Some definitions actually say that there's been as many as 26 or 20 in the 20s um, mass extinctions, whereas other scientists say that there's only been two or three. However, it is clear that we are in a major biodiversity crisis, and the general consensus from scientists is that um, we are either in a mass extinction or we're about to be in one. So in other words, it's time for change. It's time we did something about it. Next slide, please. And that brings us to part two of, the of this session, and that is conservation. Next slide, please. So we've discussed that there, we are in a biodiversity crisis, but what actually are the causes of our biodiversity crisis? Well, there are loads and loads and loads of different causes, and these are just some of them, one of which is pollution in the form of air pollution, plastic pollution, um, gas and oil, fossil fuels. But there's also things like unsustainable fishing and agriculture, fast fashion, deforestation, wildlife trafficking, and so, so much more. But one thing that all of these topics have in common is that they're linked to, next slide please, Climate change, they're all linked to climate change. And yet another thing that they have in common is that they're anthropogenic, which means that they're made by humans. Humans are causing the fossil fuel to become um, air, polluted, air pollution. Humans are causing deforestation. Humans are the main people behind um, fast fashion. We're behind all of these things that are impacting the climate. So even though we've discussed mass extinctions that have occurred because of climate change, because of all these different things, Right now, climate change is happening because of us. It's not natural. And scientists all over the world completely agree that it is, it is not natural. Um, next slide, please. So again, we have all of these different topics that are causing them. But the one thing that is good that there are so many different factors um, behind this crisis is that there is opportunities for so many different people of different passions. Whether you're interested in sustainable fashion or whether you're interested in creating um, agricultural tools, um, there is a place in conservation for you. Next slide, please. Conservation is a wide and diverse area. Next slide, please. So as I've said then, um, it's a wide and diverse area. And when people think of conservation, generally they tend to think of animal conservation, going to a nature reserve and physically protecting animals. But it's not just about animal conservation. You could also um, conserve plants, or you could be um, into fighting for climate justice, because even though climate change is produced by people, by humans, it's also impacting humans too, particularly minorities and disadvantaged people. Um, so it's extremely important that climate justice is also addressed. Other areas that people can fight for is against plastic pollution, or for sustainable fashion, sustainable fishing, or, or against the unsustainable agricultural industry, you can have things like veganism. 
um, or you can fight against fossil fuels and against oil and gas pollution. Next slide, please. But first and foremost, why would we want to protect biodiversity? Why would we want to stop climate change? Why should we save it? So biodiversity is simply life itself. It's all the animals that, and plants that live on this planet and how the variety of it and how they interact. And why should we save it then? Well, without any of those things, we wouldn't have shelter, we wouldn't have water, we wouldn't have oxygen, we wouldn't have any of these things. So even if you simply um, ignore the fact that it's terrible that we are you know, reducing the life on this planet, we actually need that life on the planet. We wouldn't survive without them. So it's vital that we do protect and save um, biodiversity. Next slide, please. So as we've said, that there, we are definitely in a major biodiversity crisis, of which has many, many different causes. And as a result, there are many different aspects of conservation that youth and adults alike can join in on. Next slide, please. And within that then, there are loads of different methods to um, go about this. So essentially, um, no matter what topic you're interested in, whether it's, again, agriculture or fashion or plastic pollution or divestment of fossil fuels or animal conservation, there are two primary methods that I'm going to discuss how you can actually get into the conservation field. These are education and STEM. Next slide, please. So education then. Basically, education is simply just chatting to people about things that you're passionate about. And this could be in the form of giving seminars, like I am today, and like the Youth of Plant is, or it could be in workshops. So you bring people about and show them physically how to help conserve the planet. This could be in the form of how to identify animals and plants, or maybe you're showing them how to make a bee home because you care about bee conservation, or whatever it may be. You also have storytelling to actively engage and communicate with people. And if you're actually interested in learning more about storytelling, we, there's actually another um, seminar later today in Youthathon with two National Geographic explorers discussing storytelling. Other forms of education then are activism. So going out and, you know, calling out governments and state bodies and companies, um, forming strikes and surveys and online petitions, all of which help to educate both corporations and people alike. You also then have science communication. And this is one of my favorite, favorite aspects of, edu of education. Um, and you can have this in the form of articles, podcasts, or videos. Next slide, please. There are many different platforms you can go about doing all this. So first and foremost, you can easily just publish them yourselves. Whether you want to create your own website or blog, it's surprisingly um, a lot more simple than you might think. And um, there are plenty of different free online services you can use to create your own platform, to create your own website or blog. Um, or you can simply just use your social media, post your articles and your photographs and your videos to your social media account. Or again, you can just simply post it to a YouTube account. However, there are also many, many, many different organizations you could join as well. Um, some I'm just talking about three ones that I know about and have great experience with um, and that I would happily advocate for, but there are plenty of others that you are free to join um, on both local, national and international levels. But first and foremost is Youth STEM 2030. So this is a fantastic um, scientific journal run by youth for youth. And essentially um, Youth STEM um, publishes science communication articles. It also publishes research articles and review articles um, by youth um, of any age, essentially. There's also World Oceans Day, and they're actually releasing um, the application for the Youth Advisory Council pretty soon. Um, and I would definitely encourage you all to join that. Again, as I said earlier, this is my final year on it. Um, very sad to be going, but it was an absolutely brilliant experience. I would definitely encourage anyone to get onto it. Then you also have the Student Voice Network. And this is an amazing, amazing platform made by a young student in Australia. And essentially it's an online network for um, youth to um, discuss their innovations, their ideas, their research projects, their thoughts on so many different areas, it just in the world in general. It, some people talk about climate justice, conservation, um, technology, absolutely everything. And it actually has over 10,000 people um, on it to date. Next slide, please. 
And my top tip then, when you're discussing education in this um, <clears throat> form, is to just put yourself out there. If you have an article you want to write or a video you want to create, go do it. Because um, the most important thing is that you're passionate and that you care and likes and views, none of that really matters at all. If you want to write something, you go write it. And then the other part then is simply to ask, apply and try again. So if you are joining for, um, if you're trying to join an organization and maybe you don't get it, or maybe they say reapply next year, do that, reapply next year. There's no harm in applying and trying again. Next slide, please. STEM then, the second part that, um, of conservation that I'm gonna talk about. So this includes science, technology, engineering, and math. And STEM can kind of seem a little bit intimidating as there tends to be a bit of um, a stigma about it that only extremely intelligent people can get into STEM, which is absolutely not true at all. Anyone can get into STEM of any age, of any background, in any area. Um, STEM is for you if you care about any of those aspects. Um, you can do this by internships and volunteerships, or also solo projects. There are a ton of different ways that you can do your own scientific or engineering or mathematical analysis at home. Um, if you actually just simply have a Google and have a YouTube on it, um, there are loads of different things you can do at home. There's also a ton of citizen science projects, um, one of which I'll actually be releasing pretty soon, which will show you how to do your own ecological research project um, and test the health or fitness of your own backyard or grassland or woodland or whatever by upcycling um, products that you already have in your home, literally glass jars. That is the only thing you need to do. And for reference, people get paid to do this exact research project. So it just goes to show you don't need to have fancy resources or anything to complete actual um, scientific projects. You can also go about um, getting grants or funding as well. Um, if you have a project you want to test, an idea you want to test, or um, maybe you have an innovation you want to create, um, there are so many different options for you to get funding for this, um, more so than you'd actually expect, especially for youth. Um, and just because an organization may not say that they offer funding does not mean that they actually don't. I actually recently got funding to do my own research project and the organization doesn't advertise that they offer fundings, but I got one anyway. Um, just by simply asking and putting myself out there. So honestly, if you have an idea you want to test, a project you want to do, go research and ask for it because I guarantee um, you'll get something somewhere. Next slide, please. So STEM then, you might think STEM and conservation, okay, that's only got to do with animals and plants. And of course, ecology is a main major um, part of conservation and it's extremely important and it's extremely interesting. Honestly, ecology is where I absolutely love. Um, but you also have other areas like engineering and manufacturing. Perhaps, so example, for example, you could think of an idea to remove plastics from the ocean by, you know, creating some kind of tool or equipment or whatever your um, innovation is. And um, there's also different computer program, pro programming you can do, or even just simply creating online surveys, wondering how people are impacted by conservation and um, creating a little scientific survey on that. Next slide, please. But the top tip with science then is basically that you just you don't need a degree you don't need fancy equipment to you know participate in stem projects all you need is your passion and your excitement and just to have the confidence to go out and say you know what i'm going to try to do this i'm going to research how to do this and i'm just going to do it um, and also a, a key thing is to fail and try again because especially with science and research it's guaranteed you're going to fail in fact the whole point of science is actually to fail and to realize, okay, well, I was actually wrong, but this actually means that this happens and different things like that. So it's actually good to fail in science sometimes. Um, but the main thing is, is to try again and to keep going with your testing and your research and your um, different written abilities or whatever you're doing. Um, fail and try again. Next slide, please. So why would you actually do conservation then? First and foremost is the bigger picture. You're helping the planet and you're helping the people. As I said earlier, it's not just animals that are being impacted by climate change, but people too. People are losing out on water, on their homes, on um, shelter, on food, on so many different things. Their, their air is being polluted, just absolutely everything. So simply by doing these things, whether it's participating in sustainable fashion or um, you know sustainable agriculture, sustainable fishing, whatever it may be, you're actually helping to save the planet and the people. 
even if you don't realize it. And the other thing is to know that you also will gain um, something from doing conservation work. Um, there are so many transferable skills you gain from participating in conservation. Um, this, for example, if you write a science communication article, you gain amazing research abilities, critical thinking, um, analytical abilities, editing, so much more. And all those skills can be applied to real work, even if your work, even if your career isn't going to be in conservation or STEM, it's going to be something completely different. You can transfer all those skills to that career. So it's really, really beneficial to you as well. And also, it's a fun and passionate thing to do. It's really, really entertaining to work in conservation. Next slide, please. So the goal of this session was to answer those three questions. What is the difference between an extinction and a mass extinction? And as we said earlier, an extinction is simply where one single species dies off, where a mass, whereas a mass extinction is where multiple die off in multiple different places over a really short time frame. But even that is very simple and it's difficult to clearly define what a mass extinction is. Second question then, are we in the midst of a mass extinction? Well, the answer is maybe most likely. We are definitely, absolutely 100% in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. However, a mass extinction is somewhat debatable. It most likely is that we are in a mass extinction. Um, but it's undeniable that we need to help save our planet and reverse um, the impacts of climate change on the planet and on the animals that um, reside on it. And three then, what can we do to help the planet? So I hope the third question has been answered um, okay for you guys and that you've taken stuff on board um, and that you know that there are so many different areas of conservation. It's not just going out and protecting animals and plants. There's so much more to it no matter what you're interested in. Again, if it's fashion, fishing, agriculture, um, engineering, no matter what it is, there is a place in conservation for you. Um, and again, there's so many different ways to do that as well, whether it's writing an article, creating a video series, um, storytelling, or else if it's research project, um, getting funding for research, no matter what it is, there is an area in conservation for you. Next slide, please. Um, that is it then. So thank you for listening. I hope that has um, helped you guys a little bit. If you have any questions or anything, please let me know. Thank you so much, Amar. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. Um, that was a super fascinating um, session. Thank you so much for educating us all about that. I think a lot of us learn about um, you know, early earth life kind of in elementary school when everybody's fascinated with dinosaurs. And it's really cool that, you know, we can learn about that as, as we get a little bit older. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to send them in the chat. Um, we have, what is your favorite ocean species? Oh, that's a difficult one. I, I, I just graduated in marine science, so um, is it bad to say all of them? <laughs> I know, um, I think I like, I love whales and things like that. I think they're really, really interesting, um, especially odontocetes, which are all the whales that can echolocate, um, because interestingly, not all whales can. Um, yeah, I think that'll be my favorite, any kind of whale. Also, thank you so much for all the thank yous um, and everything like that. Really appreciate all the feedback. So, Amar, what what got you into um, marine science in general, and and um, what kind of inspired you to take your youthathon session in this direction in particular? Um, well, I actually have to say, one of my lecturers in college, Dr. John Murray, he's uh, my paleontology lecturer. But honestly, he could make anything sound so fascinating. I mean. He makes rocks sound fascinating, literally rocks, because I mean, that is what paleont paleontology is. But um, yeah, so I guess I was really inspired by all his work. And um, I kind of just wanted to share how important paleontology is um, and how it can tell us so much. Um, because in actual fact, a lot of conservation um, work uses paleontology. So the extinction rates I talked about, how we can tell that they're much, much higher today. We only know they're much, much higher today because we looked at those in history. Um, so if we didn't have all that, we wouldn't actually know much about today. Um, so it's really, really interesting. I, I just love all that. Yeah, it's, it's really such a fascinating topic. I love learning.
Uh, we do have a couple of questions in the chat here from Caitlin. Have you ever done an internship? And then from Catherine, uh, do you have any tips for students going into the veterinary or zoology fields? Um, yeah, so I've done a couple different internships um, of all different, I suppose, types. I worked in a fish farm for a while and kind of did a lot of fishery work. Um, and I've also been involved in um, kind of veterinary work as well. Again, actually, it was fish too. <laughs> but yeah, so I've done a couple different internships. Um, and then any tips for students going to veterinary or zoology fields? Um, I suppose if you're just passionate about it, because it does it does take a lot, um, a lot of time and effort, but I suppose it doesn't every course, every course would do that. But um, yeah, I suppose do your research. Um, and if anyone says that if you're doing zoology, um, because you want to work with animals and you'll never get to work with animals, don't listen to them. Because if you want to do that, because that's what I was told, <laughs> I want to work with animals, I'm going to work with animals. If you're if you're passionate about it, um, don't let anyone kind of hold you back, just go for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely with, agree with that. If you're passionate enough about something to really want to go after it, you should definitely follow that path, follow that dream. Um, yeah, Catherine says she is very passionate about it. That is what she really wants to do. So really, really awesome, awesome stuff, Amar. Thank you so much. If anybody has any last minute questions, go ahead and send them in the chat now. Uh, we did finish this one up a little bit early. Um, so again, go ahead, if you haven't already, introduce yourself in the chat. Um, we're gonna wait on our next session, uh, all of our hosts to get lined up. Um, once they come in, uh, you guys remember, please use that raise your hand function. We'll promote you to panelists and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Kavya says, describe the ocean in one word. That's a tricky question. That is a very tricky question. Um, I suppose I just, I would describe it as just life because without the ocean, we wouldn't have any of the life we have today. We wouldn't have the oxygen on the planet. We just, we just wouldn't have anything. So yeah, life, I suppose. That was a very different question, Kavya. <laughs> That's a really good, good answer for that question though. I, I would probably say the same thing, honestly. <laughs> um, and then Taylor asked, uh, what is your favorite sea animal? They said that they are a, they, their favorite animal is a seahorse. I think uh, mine, probably a manta ray. What about you? Oh, lovely. I love manta rays. Mine are probably a whale. I love whales. Any particular species of whale? Um, no particular species, but the particular group, I suppose. I love odontocetes, so they're the ones that can kind of echolocate. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have how, what can we learn from the past for how to prevent extinctions in the future? That is an awesome question. That is really cool, all right. Um, so I'm not sure how to prevent them, but I suppose how to learn about them. There are loads of different ways to learn about them. So basically, um, a thing called isotopic or geochemical signals. So I kind of touched on that earlier. Basically, scientists can look at rocks and figure out what was in them. Um, and that can tell us a lot about how um, animals responded to certain events. So whether it's, you know, sea level rise, um, changes in temperatures, volcanic activity, carbon dioxide. Um, basically, you can learn a ton about how animals in the past responded to those events. So then by knowing that, you can use that to model and predict how current animals will respond to similar events. So basically then we can learn, okay, sponges reacted this way to an increase in temperature a million years ago, but how will sponges today react to the same temperature increases? And you can use that to basically predict um, if they'll survive, how many will survive um, and things like that. And um, so it's really cool. I suppose you can use that then to kind of say, okay, well, we need to prevent a temperature increase from happening and um, things like that. Yeah, that's, that's a really good answer for that question. Um, and then one last one from the Q&A section. What was the most challenging part of your marine science degree? The most challenging part? Um, honestly, I am a major, major nerd. I absolutely love, love education and studying. I think I'll probably be in education for the rest of my life, hopefully. Um, so it was overall, it wasn't super challenging, to be honest. Um, but I suppose the most difficult part was um, 
wrapping your head around the chemistry part, I suppose. I really enjoyed that, but it was it was kind of difficult to understand sometimes. So um, yeah, ocean chemistry, probably my biggest, biggest battle to face. But Amar, thank you so much for joining us. Um, everybody say thank you to Amar and uh, go ahead and follow her on social media. Um, if you guys go ahead and uh, check us out on Instagram at youthathon, we have Amar tagged in our stories and on her post about uh, her session today. So um, thank you so much, Amar. I will talk to you later.